everyone to Katha by Shraddha and I'm really excited today because we have with us a very respected member of the Pune community, Brigadier Raghunath Jathar. Welcome sir and we are very excited to have you here on Katha by Shraddha. Thank you, I am honored you called me here. Thank you for taking the time and being here to share your story with us and all of our listeners. I can't tell you how excited I am that we finally made this happen. Don't. Right? We've been trying to get I know. get this to happen yeah. for a while now and today finally Muhurt Lagla. Oh. So I'd like to start by asking you, um, what were you like as a child in your childhood days? What well, did you enjoy uh, doing the most? You know, I enjoyed you know, I was a good student, fairly good student. Mm-hmm. And I used to like outdoor sports and games. Okay. So I'm not very good at that. I was a mm-hmm. fairly good cricketer. But not a very good, but I was fond of sports and okay. really activity. So I've been uh, fond of keeping myself fit. Keeping and, fit? Yeah. What inspired you to take that first step? Or how, how did you get inspired the very first time you thought of choosing the military as a career? Well, I was a, I'm from a middle class family from mm-hmm. Mumbai. And, uh, but unfortunately for us, we have a military tradition in our family. Mm. So, because my uncle was in the First World War as a doctor, a very eminent person, who was decorated several times. I see. And then he lost a leg in the war and he was a great hero. So, then later on, after he lost his leg, then he was sent to Nagpur as an Inspector General of Prisons. Mm-hmm. But he set the ball rolling in our family for military traditions. I see. So for at least two generations, we had a number of people in the army and air force and one or two in the navy. So he had served in the first world war, yeah. world war one. Yeah. Wow. We've just read about that in history books. <laughs> yeah. But it's amazing to know that your uncle actually served. Yeah, he served in, in the wow. in the Middle East. So he, he was a great person and he, he inspired all of us to it became part of our tradition. Really. Part of the family tradition, tradition then yeah. to choose to serve. Plus we have other uh, senior civil servants from British times who I have see. been in, in Akola in that region. I Commissioner see. And so I so see. we have tradition of good service. And that's how my father once passed a remark when somebody asked him. Mm-hmm. And I overheard that. So he said, what will this boy do? So my father said, we'll try for the army. That's our military tradition. And that's I see, and that's what and that's what took you forward. You yeah. took that to heart, and you continued. Yeah. Wow! Um, in your entire military career now, for how many years has been your? Well, I was under training for four years mm-hmm. and thirty-one years service in the army. Thirty-one so, years service yeah. in the army. Wow! And what? How did your career progress? So you completed your tenth standard or eleventh? Yes, I did. My did matric, matric at tenth class. Mm-hmm. I was. Studying in a college, right. St. Davis College in Mumbai, but uh-huh. then I, I was not really interested, I wanted to join the army. army. So, after a year, I joined, which is known as the Joint Services Wing, mm-hmm. which is the equivalent of the present NDA Kharagwasla. Yes. It started yes. there in Dehradun. And um, it, I was in the second batch, first batch was six months earlier. I see. I was in the second batch. So, so just so, when you had started that yeah. academy, you were in the second Correct. batch itself. Yes. Wow. Then it was a precursor to the National Defense Academy. To the NDA. And then the building work and the construction and all that. So for four or five years, Mm -hmm. training was there. I was there, trained for two years there, Uh and then two years for the Army. Mm -hmm. So four years of training I had in Dehradun. That was a a full-fledged training for an officer. I see. Commissioned as a second lieutenant. So let me ask you this. What does training for a new young under-training officer feel like? What 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 would your typical day be like when you were training as a young it's military a very, officer? Very, very hectic. Very mm-hmm. hectic. And uh, tiring. Okay. And uh, also intellectual in the sense you have to study a lot. I see. So it's quite try, tiring. In fact, um, some people, a few people cannot cope with that. Mm-hmm. And then they leave in between. But... Uh, but by all this, uh, same I would say systematic training, then that intensive training right from the beginning. Right. So it takes time and gradually we develop. So at least um, over 90% people will get through and the commission. So I did two years training in the Indian Military Academy, which is also in Dehradun. Dehradun. And after that, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant. As a second lieutenant? Yeah. Okay. And where where was that? Where was your first uh, post? My first posting was. 
in JNK. Okay. In in uh, Tweed area. Mm -hmm. In Hill area. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, in the 13th Battalion the Kumau Regiment. In which battalion I served throughout my career in the infantry. I was in that battalion. I see. So is that usual when when uh, you are assigned to a certain uh, regiment and a battalion? Usually do officers continue in the same? Yes, continue in the same regiment. Regiment. But may not be in the same battalion. Really? Okay. It depends on the vacancies and you know, some choice, some people prefer to be in one, some, you know, I see. like that. I see. So it is, but in the regiment, generally people don't change regiments. I see. So that's in, pretty much for life. Yeah. You are part of that there family. There are 26 battalions in the Kumau regiment. Mm -hmm. So people of one battalion generally serve there, but very often they, between the battalions in the they regiment. They can switch battalions yeah, yeah. between, but within, but under not the same it. regiment. I did not do it. But you were with one family. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. Um, so, how did your career progress from there after your first posting? Anything special that you remember from your first posting that uh, no, is remarkable was, person? First, uh, we were in uh, pickets and all that. We were mm -hmm. lonely. I see. And uh, not very, the first one or two years were not very happy as such because loneliness and mm -hmm. various things were that. Mm -hmm. But uh, then that was stepping stone. How, then, yeah, how old were you at that time at your first posting? I was coming in when I was 20, 21. Okay. And then, uh, you know, in the army, when I say same regiment, mm -hmm. you don't serve consistently with the troops all the time. Mm -hmm. In between, you are shifted every two, three hour, years, mm -hmm. they shift you from one job to another. I see. So, from the regimental life, you may go to as an instructor somewhere. I understand. Or you may go on a staff appointment. Generally, a person doesn't continue in the same job for more than two or three years. I understand. Uh, by and large. So, uh, though my, every time I went out, they came back and went to the same hotel. So, like that, regimental life career was quite a lot. Was From 1953 to about 73, 20 years mm -hmm. in the battalion, but with some gaps in between when I was out. When you were out, when you were serving yeah. as an instructor or at, yeah. in some other yeah. uh, staff, staff position. Yeah. I see. Okay. And uh, so, I'm, I'm curious what, uh, how you progressed from there onwards. How, how do the 31 years unfold? Right. Well, uh, in the regiment service, I was there till the rank of full colonel. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that took me to some other jobs, but in the battalion, I was there from right from the second lieutenant to every step I went up to be a lieutenant colonel, which was then the highest post in I the see. battalion. I see. And uh, that's why my, if you ask me, my career is particularly uh, prominent, prominent in the career was my uh, military war experience. I see, the well, wars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somehow our battalion was always there in the war, wherever the, there was action. Mm -hmm. We were there and I was always with them. So it so happened that I started off with the Goa Liberation, where we were a part of a brigade. And then I went to 62 war. So the Goa Liberation was in 1960. That was November. the war with the Portuguese. Yeah. Okay. And I was then uh, not involved in the direct action first, but mm -hmm. later on when the prisoners were caught. Mm -hmm. I had to guard the prisoners. Uh -huh. So I had about a thousand prisoners with me. Wow. And I had some exp interesting so experience. In Goa itself? Yeah, in Panjim. In Panjim, okay. Yeah. okay. They were officers and some Javans. Right, there. right. They were caught there and uh, I had to guard them. I see. So I had some good experience there. But that was a very short experience. Mm -hmm. Then my real experience started in the 62 war against the Chinese, where I was a company commander in uh, mm -hmm. Trishul, a place called Magar Hill. Okay. And uh, there was also Tajin Kumar was there, Tajin Batal. Mm -hmm. And the post next to me was held by Major Shadan Singh, who was also part of our battalion, mm -hmm. a C company, mine was D company. I see. And uh, the enemy was expected to attack on our post, my uh -huh. post. So it was a little fortified, better than others. So the D company was expecting an attack. attack. I and see. In fact, I had even D and B, both companies were under me. Achha. So I was a post commander. So we were expecting an attack on our, mm -hmm. so we are known as the military term as round of tactical importance. Round of? Tactical importance. I see. Okay. So ours was a ground of tactical importance. Uh -huh. So it was a little better fortified. Ground, uh, ground of tactical yeah. I, I heard round, I'm sorry. Okay. Ground. Ground of tactical I understand. So yeah. that's where you were expecting the enemy to attack. Yeah. So right. it was a little better fortified and mm -hmm. we were guarding the Chishul airfield. Mm -hmm. Our post was lost, the Chishul airfield would be lost. So it was a very critical post actually. Yeah. And Chishul airfield 
was uh, was a lifeline to all the troops in uh, that area. In that area. We were air dropped. Right. The road right. communication was too long. Right. And in winter time, the roads were blocked from the Srinagar and other. Mm-hmm. So we had to get everything by air and mm-hmm. we had to air dropped. Mm-hmm. So that Trishul airfield was important in that angle. I understand. So anything which is guarding that was also important. Right, right. So my post was considered important in that manner. Right, important for the enemy to actually take that post yeah. out. Yeah, so that right? they could Disrupt. dominate the airfield. Right. So that's why it was better, better, better mm-hmm. fortified. Mm-hmm. So the enemy chose to attack on the neighboring post of Sri Company, which is also a part of our battalion mm-hmm. under Major Shaitan Singh. Mm-hmm. And they fought a very grim battle, which is very famous now. Right. In the history of the Indian Army. There were 126 soldiers who were there with Major Satan Singh. 114 died fighting. Till wow. the last man, last town almost. And uh, Chinese also suffered very heavy casualties. Mm-hmm. Major Satan Singh died there and he was given the top award of Param Chakra. The PBC. So, yeah. That was a famous battle. Mm-hmm. And I was, you can say, lucky in a way that I escaped from there. Right, right. As, and uh, we were not attacked. But then I had other experiences of war as well. 65 war, I was a staff officer in the brigade. Mm-hmm. So also, well, yeah, just next to the battalion is the brigade. Mm-hmm. So I was a staff officer. I used to visit the forward areas, like an area called uh, Ichogil Canal, mm-hmm. the canal in Pakistan area, mm-hmm. on which uh, we had our troops had reached up to that on our way to Lahore. Mm-hmm. We didn't intend to capture Lahore, but we were threatening it. Right. So we went up to Ichogil Canal. And you said, Canal was 15 feet wide at that spot, which was beyond that the Pakistani troops and we on this side. So just but, a 50 feet yeah, separation with the canal. Right. But then we are, uh, when you say open canal, but then we had embankments. Mm-hmm. So we used to take shelter under the embankment. When required to fire, you fire up and come back And again. then come back down under, yeah. the, under the embankment. That's uh, that my experience is 65 watt. Uh-huh. I was staff officer looking after administration. Right, yeah. right. Uh, then after that, I have next experience was in Mizoram, mm. where I was there for two years as a company commander and very uh, intensive patrolling and counter-insurgency work had to be done. I see. Well, Mizoram are very fine people, but uh, it's, they were there. It's, uh, it's very interesting that you should mention Mizoram because we actually have an artifact uh, from Mizoram right, right here. The fan is a yeah. handmade bamboo fan very good, yeah. <laughs> from Mizoram. I know. But they are very fine people. If you have a chance, please go to Mizoram this time. Mizoram? And they are very good people and I can tell you a lot of stories about them. They, we are living and all that. Right, right. So very good. So that was a grand experience I had. So yeah. the Kumar Regiment was stationed Harin, in Mizoram? Harin Batalan. Kumar Regiment in Aizol. Uh-huh. Aizol, yeah, yeah. So we were there. And at the time, the road communications were very poor. Mm. The very thick jungles we had to operate in. Mm. And the hostiles used to try and ambush us. We also have lost time. My own company has lost the ones. Mm-hmm. But then we, one of the examples was that we were asked to go and raid a, a hostile camp. Mm-hmm. My company was told in the evening about 5 o'clock, we go now. About 7 or 8 o'clock we moved out from there. In the evening? In the evening. evening. Mm-hmm. And walked in the night uh, 20 kilometers. And we had a guide, uh, one of the hostiles had had oh. acting as a guide. So I he see. took us to an exact spot. Uh-huh. We they took the hotel totally by surprise and we guarded that. Then they encountered those five people who were killed, mm. which included a very top leader called Zaitan Moya, his name was. I see. And he was the western, so called western army of theirs, he was the commander. Commander of that part. Uh-huh. So that was a very good experience I had. And we, uh, otherwise, all the time operating in Mizoram and all this ambush, counter ambush, very tiring. So, no two wars obviously are alike, s- alike yeah. right? But are there any similarities you can think of or? Um... No, there are uh, different type of operations. Mm-hmm. So, for example, uh, Goa was hardly a war, you can't really call right, it a war. Right, right. But uh, defenses in Ladakh, the mm-hmm. height of 18,000 feet, mm-hmm. were very different in the month of November. Right. Very cold, right. a lot of snow. So that is a entire a lot of, lot of, totally like oxygen. Totally experience. You're physically very fit to mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. Then jungles is, I don't know, thick jungles, you're operating in a different manner. And you have to go on in, in the jungle, ambushing, counter ambushing, all these things go on. So, so completely different, different, different terrains, yeah. really. Then la- next was the uh, last operation of experience was in the desert, mm-hmm. in 71 war, which is a totally different. Ah. And Rajasthan desert, you know. Right, right. 
and there was a famous battle of Longewala mm-hmm. where one company of Punjab regiment they guarded that post against a b- b- brigade of the army of the Pakistani army mm-hmm. with tanks. Mm-hmm. They came and surrounded that company post. It's a small post, but they didn't realize this is only company. They thought something more because they saw some wire. They thought this is a bigger, bigger post. They didn't attack. Had they attacked, that poor company would have been lost. I see. But they held on. In the morning, the uh, Indian Air Force came, our craft were havoc with the tanks. They saw a number of them and the Pakistanis were in headlong retreat. So they took about three, four days to go up to the border where mm-hmm. they were walking 18 kilometers. Right, right. So when they reached that uh, border pillar area, 68, our battalion was asked to attack and make sure that they are driven out from there. So we, that was my last experience of the war. I and see. all my previous experiences in war mm-hmm. they helped me to command the battalion in an effective manner. There in the desert, yes. pushing the Pakistani army yeah. back. So we had a broad daylight attack, we had launched with tanks. I see. And uh, with artillery support, machine guns. And we net pick and got in the daytime. Mm-hmm. Pakistanis lost 51 dead bodies, where we lost four. But we captured that post. Wow. It's a great success. So that was my last experience in the war as such. Now, after that, I served in the army for another two years. I rose up to the rank of brigadier. Mm-hmm. And then I commanded a brigade, then I was army headquarters, and finally retired from Sikandarabad as a sub area commander. I see. So, let me ask you this as a commanding officer on the ground, in the thick of the battle, what what do you think is the most topmost thoughts that go through a commanding officer's mind and how do you inspire your men? Well, uh, if you ask me what goes on in the thought, mm-hmm. you are only thinking of how effectively uh, we and our separatists can mm-hmm. perform. That's the sole thought at that time. Think about nothing else. So, and uh, partly or uh, most important part of your job mm-hmm. is to uh, to organize the troops, manage them, mm-hmm. and to inspire them to fight. Whichever type of operation is there. It's a matter of life and death. Yeah. Right? So, if in a company, somebody uh, gives an order, he may possibly disobey in a corporate, a civilian, corporate world. In a civilian world. But in the army, it can be allowed. Right. right. If uh, somebody disobeys an order or attack, he will not, not survive. And, for a commanding officer's order to be obeyed, mm-hmm. it's not like that anybody gives an order to be You have to inspire the man. He knows that this order has a lot of sense in it. So he obeys. There is a lot of trust. Yeah, a lot of trust right. developed over a period of time, mm-hmm. training mm-hmm. and uh, experience and man management. So all that leads to a and good... I'm, and I'm sure as a role model also. Yeah. In day-to-day interactions with yeah, your you men. Set an example. Set an example. example. So... Unconsciously or consciously, the troops will obey a good leader and they may not obey a good leader so well. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is a different story. But what I'm trying to say is that a good commander, a good commander has to all the time think of what is our main purpose is to whatever task is given, you mm-hmm. have to carry that out. Mm-hmm. Second most important, almost as important is to safety and comfort of your men. Right. You have to right. make sure that there are no unnecessary casualties. Right. That is the job of what you mentioned. Uh, what is the thought what in is the, right, How right. can I perform my job with the least amount of casualties? Effectively with the least yeah. damage to my that's company. That's right. By having artillery fire, support, mm-hmm. tanks, mm-hmm. all these things help. So that's a... That's a so strategy me. and logistics of how that is yeah. going to be Tactics. carried out. Tactics. Yeah. So if you still be headlong your attack, there will be a lot of casualties. Right. You go from the flank and actually right. using camouflage and so on. Right. Same casualties. Wow. <laughs> So thank you for sharing that, that because as civilians, it is, you know, what we know of the army or what we know of the life of a soldier per se is what we watch on television or on the screen. So it's good to get a first hand account of, you know, what does it feel like to be on the ground? You know, Uh, let me ask you this. uh, Any, any particular other incidents through your career that you would like to share, whether it is uh, with a military, uh, you know, time or your Time. I had some, I think everybody has some experiences like that. So Something that has stuck with you and yeah. that can, you know, that may hold a lesson or two for us. Well, one of the things uh, I remember was that uh, uh, I was put, uh, transferred from Jalandhar, mm-hmm. 
and transferred to Ladakh again Achha. in, in, in 1980. Mm-hmm. So I was going, I had to go to Chandigarh, then board an aircraft and go to Leh. Mm-hmm. So I was scheduled to go in the morning. Okay. And my mother was staying with me and then mother, mothers are mothers. So she cried a lot when I was leaving. In the yeah. Uh, and some of that, normally she didn't cry that much, but that day she was crying a lot. Mm-hmm. So I just thought to myself, uh, I don't know why it happened. So instead of going the morning flight, I decided I'll go in the afternoon flight. Okay. Uh-huh. And then morning, Stay a little longer with her. Yeah. Uh, no, not, uh, I don't, can't explain why, but I was in Chandigarh. Mm-hmm. I said, let me just avoid the morning flight. I was so moved by my mother. Mm-hmm. So I said, I'll go in the evening. Mm-hmm. And the morning flight crashed in that. Really? Everybody died. My so, God. That's God's grace, we can call it, or whatever it is. So, like that, this is an experience wow. I, I always remember. Yeah, yeah. And uh, another experience like that was in uh, Mizoram. Mm-hmm. You're walking in the jungles, and uh, Jawan, there was always Sati with us, Jawan. Mm-hmm. He was behind me. Mm-hmm. And my weapon was. He has a sling, if you have seen a weapon, he has a sling. Okay. It is, by bit which you hold it on your shoulder. Yes, yes. A supportive sling for the weapon, yeah. So my Sati who was walking behind me saw that the sling is causing a little discomfort to me, mm-hmm. the belt. Mm-hmm. So he decided to move my weapon, mm-hmm. which is sunk, like this, to mm-hmm. make it comfortable for me. Mm-hmm. And that weapon was a very primitive type of weapon. Okay. Me. A bullet went up. <gasps> when it just fired. Head, when, when bullet off in the jungle, Take out the jungle at night and went just past my head. And my narrowly goodness. missed my, past my head. So like that, these two experiences are there. Uh, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> See, these various things are exposed Sir, to in the army. Such a close call. I mean, yeah, it's so many times. I'll tell you uh, now in a different context. I was a young officer mm-hmm. and we are teaching is whenever we take out the revolver, mm-hmm. we must always remove the ammunition. Huh. You can't leave a weapon. Detach the ammunition yeah. and then unload set it, uh, unload it. Huh? I was a young man, I didn't realize that. And I had put that weapon like that. And my Sati, the Batman, the orderly came, cleaned it up. He didn't realize it. And he kept on cleaning it. And then he realized it is loaded. Something like it, nothing happened. Nothing happened, yeah. He told me, and when he came, I said, what a said, very sorry, girl. something yeah, would have yeah, gone wrong. Yeah. Could have been an accident, yeah, yeah. yeah. So these are the type of experiences everybody has. I mean, I earlier in Mizoram, you were extremely tired walking through the jungles, you were drizzling and all that. Mm-hmm. So I was taking shelter of a tree and uh, resting myself like this. Mm-hmm. When I saw a snake, big snake, green one, on my left thigh. On your thigh? Yeah. Came up, went to the right thigh and went down. <laughs> I said, what to do? I just <laughs> didn't move, I just froze. You just, you just became the tree. I just froze. <laughs> I just froze. I did nothing, I went so then after that my fear of snakes all went away. I had no fear. But snakes as you know, yeah, snakes you don't want to attack you if you are not if, if you don't bother them, yeah, they usually stay. If you are not trying to kill you, you know, Of course, it's a defensive snakes. thing for yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. So, wow. that type of experience. <laughs> <laughs> In Marathi you say, no, Angavar Katala. <laughs> that's a, wow, it's quite... Uh, Alright, uh, Brigadier, tell us a little bit about your family. If you... Well, let's see... Uh, uh, I told you about my parental side. Yes. But when I married also, I had thought to myself, I must marry a girl with a military background. Mm-hmm. So as luck would have it, she, my wife, mm-hmm. she no more now, but she was an army daughter. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you have seen her, very... Yes, of very course. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, very smart lady. And she was from she, military she background. She had an amazing, amazingly, amazing personality. Personal, very good personality. Very... Strong, very determined, strong, yet so much at peace. And very graceful. And very extremely graceful. graceful. Excellent extremely teacher. Grace. Yeah. Elegant. Her yeah. children still remember from Allahabad and all these days. And they keep writing and all that. So she was yeah. very popular. Yeah. So that was my wife. And I had two children, two sons. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, they didn't join the army. So they were in civil life. But there, I firmly believe when people ask me, I said, Everybody doesn't have to join the armed forces to serve the country. Right, right. I personally believe that whatever job you have, do it honestly and sincerely mm. to the best of your ability and best of the organization. Interest. Right, right. I think you've done a job. That is your service yeah. to the country. Everybody doesn't have to join the armed forces. So everyone can serve, con- 
the country just yeah. by being correct doing the best that they can do yeah if you are a good teacher then be a good yeah. teacher be the best teacher you can if you are a storyteller tell the story very well <laughs> you serve i'm glad to know that i'm serving my country in some way yeah. by doing this that's yeah. great yeah that's, it's part of nation building guys community building is yeah. part of nation nation building absolutely yes wow all right and um, and i i know that your um, in your extended family also you have others that serve yeah. um, i just said uh, two three generations of jatas right. were there and the bards also now many of them are no more mm. and uh, one of them is there in the major also very eminent person mm-hmm. he is in pune mm-hmm. there is the only one now surviving army man and that's all no more some very and if you ask me uh the this thing awards gallant award mm-hmm. i don't think there is any family in maharashtra or possibly in india mm-hmm. which has got as many awards as our family has. really what how does it uh, can you tell us a total or yeah, no, tell us you, the awards i told you my uncle has yes, got yes. dso award the no dso award. stands for the distinguished service order distinguished service order he was the first order. one to get a dso and also a bar ah bar okay. is second time right right once he got in uh, middle east iraq second one he got in the afghan war where he lost his leg so for for our listeners who don't understand what a bar is it's once you get an award if you get awarded uh, again, the same award again it's called they a bar add a bar yeah. to the award yeah it's very rare right but there's right. one bar yeah uh-huh. then another bar um, person was uh, ashok chakra top award mm-hmm. and that was he was not army he was a civilian mm-hmm. in the air india okay and he was a pilot in okay. 1955 uh-huh. and uh and the kashmir princess she was flying and there was a big explosion the chinese national chinese from taiwan they wanted to kill the passengers who were chinese national i see in that aircraft yeah they were flying the ministers they were, uh-huh. they were flying to a meeting for bandung conference okay first asian conference mm-hmm. so he was the pilot my cousin captain dikke jada i see so he being a pilot and when he landed here to crash land mm-hmm. on seas mm-hmm. so aircraft put in two broke in two parts as he landed three people managed to escape mm-hmm. the crew arrest my cousin and others were killed i see but my son my cousin never left the cockpit he was on the body the very the, trying to so he was also awarded to the awards mm-hmm. he was a top award of ashok chakra right. civil right right So and then we had another cousin of mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, his son of that Colonel Jatar, which I mentioned. His son, he was Brigadier Jatar. He got a Mahavir Chakra, which is also a very, very high award. Mm-hmm. Another nephew of mine, uh, he got a Vir Chakra, a sixty-five award. So a lot of awards like this. Lot of uh, uh, so various people. Lot various of deeds of bravery. Yeah. And acts of heroism. Yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> Let me um let me ask you this. You already gave us a message that it's not necessary to join the armed forces per se in order to serve your country. If you do, that's fantastic. But if you just do your job well and to the best of your ability, you can serve your nation. What would be another message that you'd like to share with our, especially our young listeners, the children that listen to this? I would say it's a frequent question asked to us veterans mm-hmm. mm-hmm. in the present context. Mm-hmm. They say. China is a much more powerful country than us. How are you going to take them on? And mm-hmm. particularly in Pakistan, mm-hmm. also is against us. Right. How will you handle that? So my message to them is, of course, we have also had a lesson in '67 when our uh, particular division mm-hmm. under Major General Sagar Singh uh-huh. they taught a lesson to the Chinese in uh, in. Uh, Post called I forget the name of the post, mm-hmm. but it was a sixty-seven. In nineteen sixty-seven. Yeah. Yeah. If we decide to fight it out, which I'm sure army at present will do it, mm-hmm. and they fight it out, Chinese will have to. I mean, they may be more powerful, but the will of the which has morale and all the training and the guts of in the army is very professional army. And how can civilians support our armed forces? What what kind of support do soldiers or you know officers that are on the front and away from their own families you know fighting for the country and keeping us safe on a every hour of every day what kind of support can we civilians you, you know, know every, give every war that we have been hmm. my experience is that every time 
A country as such has risen like one man and they always supported the army. Right. Whether right. it's 62 war, 65 war and our civilians have done a lot. For example, I remember in 65 war, mm -hmm. uh, the Punjabis, the Sikhs and whoever they there, they used to open their houses wherever, wherever they could do, they will spare it for the army. I see. It came to that. Right, right. So like that, uh, Moral support and physical support. Ladies have gone out of their way to provide jerseys and, 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 and knit right. jerseys and send them out. Right, right. So right. this very fact that uh, people are with you, it's uh, emboldened to you. Right. And and what about letters? I know that sometimes school children write letters to uh, people in the armed forces. Oh, yeah, they will appreciate it very much. Much, and yeah. it gives a little, yeah. little bit of spark of joy, maybe. I know. Yeah. Especially you talk about being lonely, right? Yeah. So when you receive letters from an unknown child somewhere yeah. in the country, I'm sure that that helps to some degree. Yeah, uh, in '62 war when I was in Ladakh, the height of 18,000 feet in November, very cold, and we are expecting an attack, imminent attack was there. I had a, a letter from a, a Naga lady married to an officer. I see. In peace area. Uh huh. He said. You're like my brother, fight it out and do that. I got that wow. just before the action. And uh, my own sister also wrote. So these things do inspire you, you know, inspire. you really appreciate right. that time. Of course. In yeah. the dark, in those days. Yeah. For one month I didn't get any mail. So when I got the mail, first thing by my letters, my wife used to write that every day. Right. So I had to put them in a serial order first. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you, achha, you got them all in one bunch. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very important to date your letter yeah. so you know when the letter was sent. <laughs> so my officer used to talk to his I was the major. He was serializing his letters. <laughs> his letters from his wife. <laughs> <laughs> so at least you know the what what you know what she was trying to communicate to yeah, you over, right. over that time. Yeah. That's that's very And funny. army is a great feeling that between the officers themselves and their wives. Like There's a, a lot of camaraderie, yeah. Big yeah, family, yeah, yeah. Camaraderie lot of support, lot very of support. great camaraderie. Right. Which right. is perhaps not there elsewhere. But mm -hmm. Army, Air Force, Navy, there's a great camaraderie. Right. Yeah, you know, that won't happen in the services. We know each other it's so like well. It's like an extended family. Yeah. Really. We meet them, it's constantly, we are taught to call on each other. Right. A right. new come, person coming has to call on the seniors. To check on them and make sure they're comfortable. Check, uh, and get to know them. To Unless know you them. communicate well, how can you develop? Right. So right. this is something lacking, uh, I it's notice here. Missing in civil life. Missing in civil life. life. Mm -hmm. Well, anything else you'd like to share with us as a parting? No, I have to note. appreciate what you're doing to inspire the children with your stories. I've you. heard some of your stories. Very nice. Very Thank you, sir. And wish you all the success. And Thank you so much. I hope the children will enjoy it. And I'm glad your yeah, son is talking. <laughs> yes, our <laughs> cameraman behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for spending time, taking time and, and you know, actually coming on Katha and, and spending so much time with us and sharing your story. It's a very inspiring story and it tells us, it gives us a peep into what life is yeah. like, you Thank know, you for, so for the soldiers. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here and to talk to you. Thank you so Thank much. You. And thank you to all our listeners. Be sure to um, you know, share this particular episode with all of your family and all your friends uh, to inspire people and we have a few takeaway points right? on how we can serve our nation, how we can support the men at the border, the, the, the immense armed forces that are away from their families and are doing this to keep us safe. I think it's our duty to support them even like a letter once in a while and yes, go and say hi to your neighbours. Let's build the community. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah.